and welcome. Welcome, folks. We're going to give it a minute as folks filter into the Zoom room, but welcome to our program today. Good afternoon. It's great to have you all here. Thank you guys so much. My name is Jess Cataret. I'm with Conservation Voters of PA and Penn Future, and we are honored to be joined today by Adam Waterbear DePaul of Lenape Nation of PA. And we're gonna get started in just a minute. Folks are still piling into the Zoom room. Uh, and while we wait for that, I'm gonna give you some quick tips and tricks. I know many of us have been using Zoom for quite some time, but we're using the webinar format today. And so along the bottom of your screen, you should see several icons that we encourage you to use throughout this presentation. Um, one is a chat box. It's a little speech bubble icon. And if you're joining us now, I encourage you to introduce yourself, throw your name in the chat and where you're calling in from. Uh, and then if you've got a question for Adam, which we will be doing a question and answer portion later on in this uh, community conversation today, we really encourage you to use the question and answer, the Q&A uh, icon, so that your question doesn't get lost in the chat. So that is the icon with two speech bubbles, <laughs> Q&A, center of your screen along the bottom. Now make sure when you're chatting, folks, there's two different ways to chat in the drop down menu. You'll see hosts and panelists, which will only chat me and Adam and uh, our fellow colleagues. And make sure you click everyone so that everyone can, can see your chats and, uh, and where you're calling in from. So we're just going to give it another moment, but if you're just joining, welcome. We're so excited to host this program today, the Lenape, the original stewards of Lenape Hoking. And hello to everyone across the state. This is fantastic. Great to have you all here. Thank you for joining us today. We're just going to give it one more moment. Oh, wow, folks from everywhere. Amazing, amazing. So we're gonna go ahead and get started, folks. Like I said, my name is Jess Cataret. I use she, her pronouns, and I am our field director here for Penn Future and Conservation Voters of PA, two statewide environmental advocacy organizations. And we're so honored to be joined here today by Adam Waterbear DePaul of Lenape Nation. And so quickly, I'm gonna just tell you a little bit about our organizations in case you haven't worked with us before and a little bit about why we're here today. And then I'm gonna pass it over to our keynote speaker uh, so that we can hear some exciting information about the Lenape and learn more about what, how we can support their tribe today. And then we're gonna open it up for a question and answer. So once again, if you have a question for Adam already, please use the Q&A function so it doesn't get lost in the chat. And that's along the bottom with two speech bubbles. And our team will get that question right to us for the question and answer portion. But first, let me just tell you a quick a bit about our two organizations, Penn Future and Conservation Voters of PA. We are two organizations working to protect the air that we breathe, the water we drink, and the land that we live on. Penn Future has incredible policy and legal expertise, and Conservation Voters of PA helps to elect environmentalists to office. Both organizations work to push for pro-environment legislation in the world that we live in, and also have a strong commitment to equity and justice in that fight. And that's why this month, Native and Indigenous Peoples Heritage Month, we wanted to be sure to honor this month by offering the opportunity to learn and support some of the indigenous tribes that live here right in Pennsylvania. Now, Native and indigenous peoples are often erased from US history. And the history we do learn is often incredibly whitewashed. And so we know it's important to face the truths of our history and center Native and indigenous voices as we work to dismantle white supremacy and diversify the environmental movement. Now, unfortunately, Pennsylvania does not have any state or federally recognized tribes 
but that of course does not mean there aren't native and indigenous peoples living here. And sadly, we do know that black, brown, and low income communities, as well as native and indigenous peoples, are disproportionately negatively impacted by environmental justices, climate change, and climate migration. But that they've also been key leaders in many climate and social justice movements. And so that's why we're humbled to open up this community conversation today with Adam Waterbear DePaul, the tri a tribal council member of the Lenape Nation of PA, as well as the nation's story keeper. Adam co-curates the Lenape Cultural Center located in Easton, PA, which if you haven't checked out, I encourage you to do so. And he co-curates an exhibit, Existing Artistry, Enduring Presence, the Lenape Nation of Pennsylvania at Temple University, where he's a PhD candidate and an instructor with a primary research area in cultural and mythological studies. And so without further ado, I'd like to pass it over to Adam Waterbear. Adam? What is she? Thank you, Jess. And hello to everyone. I'm so happy to see so many interested people here. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this talk and I am really thankful for Conservation Voters and Penn Future bringing me here. Um, this is an, an incredibly important crowd to hear a lot of what I have to say. Uh, now, one thing I want to say off the bat, I am a member of the Lenape Nation of Pennsylvania and we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. As such, we are not per permitted to do any campaigning for any political party. So I do have to make sure that I, I say that's not what I'm here to do today. Um, what I'm here to do is of course, to give a little bit of history about our people and about our nation and talk on uh, one of the most important and central things to all Lenape people, which is good stewardship of the land. Um, and you folks are the people who are making the decisions that matter, who are helping the legislation pass that matter for these issues. So I'm just so happy uh, to be here and to, to be a part of that. So I'm going to give you a very brief history of the Lenape. I don't want to spend a long time on a history lesson, but I do just want you to know um, who I am, who I'm here representing, and who the Lenape people are, in case you don't. And I'm going to uh, spend a few uh, extra minutes here and there emphasizing some things that I think will be of particular interest to you, uh, political matters, legal matters, environmental matters. But I'm going to try to wrap all that up pretty quickly because I'm looking forward to uh, you asking questions. I want to help answer whatever questions you might have, and I want to let you steer the conversation. But to get started, uh, the Lenape people are the indigenous people of Eastern Pennsylvania, Southern New York, all of New Jersey, and Northern Delaware. And this is what we call the Lenape Hoking, the land of the Lenape, or the place where the Lenape come from. Uh, we had a, a very good relationship with William Penn, uh, which some of you might have heard. That's, that's one fact, like just said, so much of our history is whitewashed or romanticized, you have to be skeptical when you hear that kind of thing. But that's one fact that was true. We had a relatively good relationship with William Penn. Um, it is with William Penn's sons that our relationships with the colonists really turned south. Uh, Penn's sons were the architects of the walking purchase, which many of you may have heard of, uh, if not in, in very broad strokes. Uh, Penn's sons asked us for some land for a family settlement. We agreed to walk for a day and a half uh, to make a, a vector line. And then however far we made it in that time to draw a line on a map back to the Delaware ri River. And we would give that little section to Penn's sons. We agreed to this out of the respect we had for his father. Come time for the walking purchase, 
uh, in the time in between, Penn Sons had hired three professional runners and had also had a swath of uh, land cleared as far as they could to make a clear, unobstructed running path. And on the day of the walking purchase, the colonial runners took off running. Um, our people walked for 10 or 20 minutes, not understanding what was going on, and then just kind of gave it up. And in the day and a half, those runners, uh, sometimes you will hear two of them died, and, and the living one was the one who made it. No one died during their walking purchase. But two of those runners did stop from exhaustion, and the one who made it the furthest um, was the place where they set that mark. And then as a, as a little uh, bonus for the colonists, when they drew the line from that point to the Delaware River, they literally spun the map. They tilted the map ever so slightly to make the angle more obtuse uh, than it should have been. But a little tilt goes a long way when you're working with that kind of scale. So at the end of the day and a half, when we had expected to give a couple acres for, for a family settlement, we ended up losing an amount of land in Pennsylvania about the size of Rhode Island. These are the kinds of deals that cost us much of the land that we lived on. Um, there are many ways we we lost uh, the ability to live in our homelands. Of course, some was through outright murder and bloodshed or being forced out at gunpoint. Uh, many other instances were agreements like these that were in one way or another um, underhanded uh, land dealings, legal documentation. So through all of these methods, uh, many of us were forced to leave the Lenape Hoking. And we went in all directions. Uh, we spread out all over uh, west and uh, north and central westward. You know, we, we scattered where, where we had to. And this was not a single movement. Uh, sometimes people get the idea that these kind of relocations are, well, the Lenape picked up one day and they walked out to Oklahoma and sat down and that was the relocation. Uh, it doesn't go like that for any people. This was a matter of uh, moving as far as we felt safe at the time. And that might be somewhere like Western Pennsylvania and then settling and trying to reestablish our community and our way of life and maybe spending a couple months or even a year or two there until colonialism caught up with us and forced us to move again. And then we'd end up in Ohio and then Kansas. And this is a, a long history of continuous um, uprooting and moving and settling. And in all these settlements, sometimes uh, Lenape would, some Lenape would find a way to stay behind. So we would settle in Ohio and then we would be forced to move, but a couple of families would stay there, maybe with some colonial families, or maybe they would hide, or maybe they'd decide, I'm not traveling with this group, we're too visible and they're going to head up north. But the main bulk of the community would then continue to move westward. So through this kind of continuous spider web of being moved, our people spread out all over the area, all over the Northeast. But the, the main diasporic groups, uh, I shouldn't say the main, that sounds like they're more important. I, what I should say is the largest diasporic groups that stayed together and ended up settling in nations that would survive in in some aspect, uh, all the way to today. There were four of those groups. Two of them settled in Oklahoma. One of them settled eventually in uh, Wisconsin. And the other group went right over the uh, north, over the United States border and settled into Canada. And those groups are the only federally recognized groups of the Lenape today. Uh, the United States recognizes three groups, two in Oklahoma, one in Wisconsin, and the Canadian government recognizes our people who went over 
into their southern border. So those are the federally recognized tribes of uh, the Lenape. Now, those are our diaspora, those of us who were forced out of our homelands. Meanwhile, uh, many other of us were able to stay here in the Lenape Hoking, and there are a few ways that that happened. Uh, some families struck up some kind of deals with uh, colonial families. These kind of deals usually involved something like indentured, indentured servitude in order to stay here. Other people did hide in uh, what was then still this great northeastern wilderness where there was plenty of space to hide. But the primary way that our people stayed here uh, was through marriages between colonial men and Lenape women. These marriages um, took place uh, both before and during the forced relocations. So even before uh, Penn Sons and the walking purchase and, and uh, being forced out, there are records of um, colonial men marrying Lenape women. They seem to have very good relations, and colonial men seem to be very fond of marrying Lenape women. And there are several reasons for that. Some of that had to do with our lifestyle and, and differences in beliefs um, that actually fostered good relationships. But the primary reason uh, that colonial men took a liking to marrying Lenape women was that our women were the masters of the agricultural science. They knew everything there was to know about the land. Uh, the colonists, of course, were on foreign soil. They didn't know what would grow and what wouldn't. They didn't know how often crops needed to be rotated or uh, how long the soil could be used and how hard it could be used before it would give a dry season. So our women were largely responsible for uh, the colonists' ability to survive and thrive the way they did those first few uh, years. Now, the caveat to staying here in our homeland, the, the condition for those women when they married into those colonial families is that publicly they disavowed, uh, or I should say they didn't mention anything of their Lenape heritage. If you stayed in the colonists, in the colonies, you were a colonist and you acted like it. You didn't speak the Lenape language. You didn't dress in your traditional dress. You certainly did not um, partake in any religious or uh, spiritual ceremonies. Right? You spoke, you dressed, and you acted like a colonist because all of our practices were heathen practices. They were the practices of savages and the godless people. And when you stayed here, um, it was not only to help the colonists survive, but also for our own personal benefit, we would become more civilized by becoming white people. So this is how we survived here. Now we have some records of particularly what you would call for the time progressive households, where the patriarch of the family might allow the woman to speak some Lenape to her child, or might even allow children to have something like a corn husk dolls, some kind of traditional toys. So there are some records of that, and that did happen, uh, but very few and far between, and that did not uh, extend outside of the front door. So for years upon years, upon decades, centuries, we lived here in hiding. Uh, we acted white, we uh, talked white, we dressed white, even down to the census data. Things like uh, birth and death records, marriage records, if we were allowed to have them, we would check off the white box, we would identify as white. Now, very often, our people were not allowed these kind of records. 
um, one of the contributing phenomena to this um, idea of Native American burial grounds. Okay, not the only thing, but one thing that contributes to to this idea that people have is the fact that many of us were not allowed to be buried in Christian cer uh, cemeteries. So even if we did live a colonist's life, uh, we were still on our deathbeds considered heathens and uh, buried in separate uh, burial grounds. Some of us were, uh, some of us were allowed to be buried in Christian cemeteries. Some of us were allowed to have documentation. We have members today who come to our nation for membership and they submit their genealogies. And we still get people whose family histories uh, involve something like, um, this was just a month or two ago, we got someone who had a an old marriage certificate. And the it said, um, changing the name, it said, John Smith married to woman. And that's the only mention of that person that exists on record, um, just enough so the man had a record that he was married. So through processes like this, we stayed here and we were successful in our hiding. And this is uh, due to kind of a double blindness, right? We did assimilate, we did hide, and we passed our traditions down through the oral tradition to our children. So our culture survived as well as it could. Um, and it, in the public face, we, we did not express it. At the same time, the colonies were all too willing to help with the narrative that there are no more Lenape left here, that all the Lenape left, and that uh, everyone who is here is white and we're all colonists. The colonists didn't want uh, a narrative that their colonies were, were white and Indian. You know. So between our uh, efforts in hiding our culture, and the colonists being all, all too willing to further that narrative, we got completely off the radar. Of course, um, later, not too much later, but later comes the Indian boarding schools. We're all familiar with this phenomenon. Uh, probably they've received a lot of uh, press lately. We know of the school in Carlisle, we know of the schools in Canada that have recently hit the news. Strangely enough, as uh, even though we have, uh, there was this permeating, permeating narrative that all the Lenape left the East Coast and none live here anymore. When the Indian boarding schools popped up, they seemed to find a lot of people out here that they wanted to put in them, and they did. And later, Finally, we would find, uh, we would feel it was safe, and I mean safe, physically safe, to come out and start reestablishing our communities. But when I say later, this is incredibly recent uh, historically. And uh, what I mean by that, for one example, is that we still have elders in our community that remember being uh, forced into the Indian boarding schools and having those experiences there. You can still talk to elders who will share their experiences with you. So very recently, we finally were able to come out of hiding and let people know that we have always been here and we never left. Now, my nation, the Lenape Nation of Pennsylvania, is a representative of uh, these Lenape who stayed and never left. And my nation isn't the only nation. There is the Nanticoke Lenny Lenape in New Jersey. There's the Ramapo Lenape in New Jersey. There are nations in Delaware. And we all uh, are largely represented 
by the Lenape, uh, not the diaspora who were forced out, but by those who remained here and kept our nations together in secret. Now, none of us out here have federal recognition. As I mentioned before, the only nations that have federal rec recognition are those three diasporic nations and also our, our relations in Canada. And the reason for that, uh, we will never be eligible for federal recognition, none of us here who remained behind. We will never be eligible unless the federal laws change. And that comes down basically to one guideline, one law that says, uh, paraphrased, in order to be eligible for federal recognition by the government, you must have a government to government relationship with the United States government since the 1700s. Okay. Now, I'm sure uh, many of you can already put together how this happened and uh, how this guideline that is put forward actively um, stifles and and uh, and is, is well gatekeeps the federal recognition process. Our diaspora who were moved, who were pushed, who were herded out, our relations who went through that tumultuous journey and finally were able to find a home in Oklahoma, and Wisconsin, and Canada. The government always knew where those nations were because they were pushing them. Those of us who remained here, again, we remained here by getting off the radar, by hiding, by keeping our nations and our traditions a secret. And now that we can come out, uh, because we were successful in that, and because the colonies were happy to let us go uh, off the radar, now the government says, uh, and certain other people say, uh, you're not a nation. We don't see your chain. We see you were here, but then you disappeared. So you don't exist anymore. All of you left. So that's a problem with the federal guideline um of recognition now that's at the federal level we also have state recognition right and state recognition is a whole different entity uh state recognized uh state recognition of a native american nation means absolutely nothing other than what the state and the nation decide. There's no standard. So I'm gonna pull these completely off the top of my head, but just, you know, Idaho can recognize a Cherokee nation and that can mean nothing other than, well, it's on record that Idaho said, okay, you're Native American. And that's what state recognition means for them. Meanwhile, um, you know, Utah can, uh, recognize a Lenape nation, and that can involve a 200 page bill that has been negotiated and contains all kinds of things from possible, I don't know, funding, educational programs, leniency on environmental restrictions, on uh, ceremonial uh, practices, and, and all kinds of other things. So state recognition is really just the whim of the state and uh, the bill proposed by the, by the nation in question and what they agree on. And as just said, uh, Pennsylvania is the only state, Commonwealth, of course, is the only state in the Lenape Hoking that has never recognized a Native American people. Um, New York has uh, not the Lenape, but New York has uh, recognized Native American peoples, New Jersey, uh, our relations in New Jersey are state recognized, our relations in Delaware are state recognized. Pennsylvania uh, never has recognized a people. We uh, went for state recognition a while ago now, about 15 years ago, give or take some. Um, it was actually going very well. 
And then there was an election in Pennsylvania during this process, which is, you know, it's a year or two process at least. You don't just go and get a stamp. And the, uh, the new boards that came in uh, didn't want to pursue recognition with us. And the major issue on the table at that time was gaming in Pennsylvania. We have always been a, uh, uh, we have always been against bringing gambling into Pennsylvania, not on any ethical concern. Many of our relations uh, have casinos and, and it supports their community and that's a wonderful thing. We have always been concerned about the environmental impact. And um, at the time when they were considering giving us recognition, uh, they liked that we didn't like casinos. Gambling wasn't here yet. When the election changed, um, the new people who came in wanted casinos and they didn't like uh, that we were against them. And basically they wouldn't talk to us anymore. Now, the irony is that a state recognized tribe has absolutely no control over casinos anyway. Only federally recognized tribes can do that. But still, uh, they were playing off the stereotype of uh, Native Americans and gambling and what it would mean to their constituency if they would give recognition to a tribe that might someday say publicly, I'd rather not see uh, casinos in Pennsylvania. This is what the process of recognition is. It is never about cultural identity. It is about uh, constituents and uh, what that will mean for a person's political platform. Um, the last thing I want to mention very briefly, and you can ask me to expand on any of this, is uh, our Rising Nation River journey. Even though we don't have uh, recognition, that doesn't stop us from thriving and having initiatives today to continue our culture and to revitalize our culture. Um, I'm not monitoring the chat. Uh, Jess is going to be kind enough to do that for me, but I saw something pop up about language. One of our strongest initiatives today is revitalizing the language. Uh, and we have, we are very successful in that. It's, we are very proud of our language program. I'd be happy to talk more about that. Uh, another of our strongest initiatives is the Rising Nation River Journey. And there's more information about this on our website. But uh, very briefly, we paddled down the uh, Delaware River for about three weeks. And we stop all along the river to sign treaties with organizations, individuals, anyone who's interested. And the treaty is not legally binding. Uh, it asks for uh, two things. It asks one, that people acknowledge that the Lenape are the indigenous people of this homeland and of this land, and they further that knowledge however they can. And it asks, too, that people act however uh, their capacity allows as good stewards of the environment. It's very environmentally centered. We've been doing that every four years since 2002. And over the years, we have made some incredible partnerships that have just blossomed into so much good action for awareness of the Lenape people and for um, environmental conservation. Just a few of the many wonderful partners we've made out of that trip are people like um, the Audubon Society, the Friends of the Wissahickon, uh, the Lower Delaware Wild and Scenic. We have historical societies, uh, academic institutions, and many, many um, environmental organizations. That uh, trip is coming around again this summer. Last one was in 2018. The next one will be this summer in 2022. So if anyone here would like to get involved, uh, please let me know. Um, you can get uh, in touch with us through the website. Um, there's email and the messaging uh, possibility there. And we can talk about how you could get involved, whether you just wanna come sign the treaty, whether you wanna paddle a day or three weeks if you're crazy like some of us, um, or if you actually want to do a program, um, we'd love to 
talk to you about any of that. So there's so much more to discuss, but uh, like I said, I'm going to uh, shut up and turn it over to you because I want to know what interests you. Amazing. Adam, thank you so much for sharing all of that information with us. And we do have dozens and dozens of questions. And so we're going to get to as many as we can. But uh, we're also going to drop some resources in the chat of how you can get in touch with the Lenape Nation of PA and Adam and, and continue the conversation and continue the learning. So first up, we've got a question here. Um, and folks are interested to hear more about you know, what environmental stewardship practices that, uh, that the Lenape Nation and Lenape peoples have practiced that, that you would love for, for other Pennsylvanians or folks around the world to, to practice? That's a great question. And, um, and I'm gonna go through this very quickly. Um, many environmental science-oriented folks ask us things like, what, what, what was the Lenape traditional way of cleaning the waters or cleaning the pollution in the air or the land or, or something like that? And it's a really, uh, you know, it's a difficult question because like I said, environmental conservation isn't everything it means to be Lenape. It's in our creation story. It's in every ceremony we, we hold. Um, it's in the prayer that we open every council meeting and every meeting with. So to be Lenape, it just means to be uh, respectful of all our relations, the winged ones, the creepy crawlers, the fish people, the standing trees, the rocks, the rivers, and, and everyone else we share this land with. Now, we do have a couple things to point to if you want specific practices, like, for instance, the Three Sisters way of gardening gets a lot of attention. Um, ways like that of planting crops in such a way that it minimizes harm or reduction of minerals to the soil so that you can continue to use that land rather than pick up and plant and, and ruin acres and acres for a small crop. We also had ways of um, hunting and gathering where we would always pass by the first thing we came to. We would not hunt or gather the first thing, we would start at the second. So we always knew uh, we were leaving something behind. But that being said, other than those few examples, we did not have ways of uh, depolluting the water, of depolluting the air, because those were questions or those were answers to a question that hadn't existed yet, right? We didn't have to worry about that until we were too colonized to be able to practice large scale cleaning things. Now, today that takes a different note. We are involved in many things. Um, uh, we uh, have, we are represented on the board of the Friends of the Wissahickon. They invited us to sit on their board, which was amazing. We are, we are represented on the Council of the Lower Delaware Wild and Scenic. So organizations like that who want our input and bring us on um, help us to have an active role as environmental stewards um, today, what that means today, which is being involved in somewhat of a legislative and planning level. We also take action on things like pipeline, uh, uh, pipelines, uh, large scale construction projects that seem to cause more environmental harm than is um, warranted, uh, like the, the recent rock wall projects in New Jersey and, and Route 80 in Pennsylvania. So we're involved in those uh, on the ground and grassroots campaigns as well. Wonderful, thank you, Adam. Now, a lot of folks today have um, are very concerned that there's that there's no recognition here in Pennsylvania, and and some are learning it for the first time, and and asking folks like Jane are asking how is it how is it possible Pennsylvania doesn't recognize tribes, and many folks, including Jeffrey, Glenn, others, you know. Are there ways that, that white or other non-Indigenous people can support your efforts to gain recognition here in Pennsylvania? Um, 
Absolutely, there are. Um, now, right now, we are in the process. Um, I forgot to mention this bit. I'm sorry, this is good for you to know. Uh, very recently, we formed a committee and we decided to go for recognition again. And we are in the process right now. Now, at the moment, we are telling people, um, thank you so much for your support and hold that thought. We are seeing uh, how it's going at the level of legislation and it might go easier. So far, um, we're making progress. COVID threw a wrench into everything, all the law offices shut down. Um, so uh, it took a little more time, but we're making slow and steady progress. And there is nothing uh, we would like for things to move forward in this way, in a good way of just a good meeting and some discussions and have it done. Now, if that isn't the case, and if there is a pushback uh, for reasons that don't seem justified like there was last time, then there will definitely be a space for grassroots campaigning, letter writing, and uh, really showing some support um, when we get there, if we get there. So, so I would say, hold that thought, reach out to us. Um, it's wonderful to know that we have support out there. And also, you know, uh, you can def definitely mention it if you're in touch with any legislatures or state politicians, uh, you know, let them know they can get in touch with us. It's a great time in the process right now for making more introductions and for bringing more legislators in who are interested in helping us who might just not be aware that it's happening. Um, and everything further, uh, hold that thought and I'll be happy to let people know if, if we need more support than that. Yeah, um, Adam, I know when I personally asked you this several months ago, you know, and I asked what's the best way to, to stay on top of the fight, um, do you, could you speak a little about to the newsletter? I bet there are folks here that would, that would love to be a part of that and how to get in touch with you about it. Oh yeah, we, we have a monthly newsletter. And um, please, if you're interested in, in getting the newsletter, just email us and, and let us know and we'll put you on the list. We are, we're unfortunately not technologically advanced yet where you can like go on the website and click a button and you're on it. Um, but email us, let us know you want to be part of the newsletter and, and you'll get it every month. And our newsletter, we give updates as we have them on state recognition um, and all kinds of other stuff. We have uh, bits of language and stories in the newsletter. We have reports on all the stuff we do and all the upcoming events. You a lot of people found out about this through the newsletter. Uh, so please feel free. And the best, uh, is there, you said the, to email you, is the, is the, are you the best person to email or is there a contact form on your website the best place? Uh, the best place is the contact form or emailing us at the info at Lenape Nation .org. Oh, perfect. And I know my colleagues will drop that in the chat for folks and we'll also include it in the follow-up email to everyone about this. Great. That's the uh, the person who uh, answers and sorts our email is the person who takes, who makes the mailing list. So if you email me, I just email your information to her anyway. <laughs> okay, perfect. Perfect, well, thank you, Adam. So, all right, so we've got some time for more questions here. So Michelle's asking, what are your thoughts on using tribal sovereignty as a way to stop fossil fuel extraction projects and protect environmental rights? And is this something you see the Lenape Nation of PA being able to do if they gain state recognition? What is my view on using tribal sovereignty? to oppose those things. Um, just for part one, I, I don't, I do not get behind uh, the sentiment of those words. What that sounds like to me is manipulating your cultural identity for some kind of end. That's what the term using signals to me. And that I, 
I don't get behind. Um, but if a, a fracking company or pipeline company or, or anyone, anyone else, if someone is trying to come in to uh, land occupied by a, a sovereign nation and harm the earth there, uh, you know, that nation should be able to say no, just like any one of you should be able to say no if, if the pipeline's going through your house, you know. Um, what the, the phenomenon we often face is, oh, can I remember? It's cultural, I believe the term is cultural racism. I was just introduced to this term, but it's great for this phenomenon. Something we'll very often see is a pipeline or something going through, you know, a well-to-do or a, or a uh, middle, middle class uh, town and the people will all protest it because they don't want it in their town because they know what kind of damage it does. And because of their uh, economic privilege or their racial privilege and or uh, those types of things, the company will say, okay, we'll just reroute it through uh, Indian country, right? And our people in that area don't have the political power, don't have the platform to have their voices heard, don't have the money to donate, to have politicians listen to them. And so it ends up being their land that gets devastated by these things. So in cases like that, the fact that tribal sovereignty, which is, you know, this is just another tool of the government, just like any kind of rec recognition is, but unfortunately, we live in this time and we have to use the master's tools, right? Um, in that circumstance, if tribal sovereignty gives those people a platform where their voice can and has to be heard, at least as much as every other person who doesn't share their racial or economical um, misfortune, I think it's a wonderful thing. Now, do we see that for the happening for our nation? Um, very unlikely, because uh, again, we are not eligible for state recognition or for federal recognition due to that law. The the only recognition we could get would be state recognition, and state recognized tribes rarely have uh, the power to to have that platform. Although in our current bill, we do have a caveat that will say we will at least have a voice in um, environmental dangers to our sacred sites. So maybe on a, on a smaller scale, we'll get our voices heard. Thank you for your, for your answer there. Now, Adam, I know that you're a story keeper for Lenape Nation of PA. And we have several folks, including Iris, and I'm trying to find your name, but can't, but the several folks asked, you know, they would love to, they're interested in Lenape art and stories, and they wanna be sure the sources that they explore are authentic and not exploitative. And I was just wondering, as story keeper, uh, you know, if, if there were any uh, places you would point folks learning, uh, excited to explore more books or movies or, or stories in that way. Do I have the ability to type in chat here? You do, you do. Okay. You'll wanna make sure that everyone is selected in the drop down and not just hosts and panelists. Yes. Um, but you do have that option. The, the best, source uh, for stories, probably the best source that exists today that is accessible is John Beerhorst. I just put his name in the chat. And there are one of two books I would recommend, depending on your interests. Um, his most accessible book is The White Deer. And the White Deer is a collection of our stories. You just pick it up and you read through it and it's just a collection of our stories. And there are wonderful things in here. We, uh, we all celebrate Beer, Beer Horst. He's an excellent story collector. He uh, 
gathered from some of our most treasured elders and uh, seem to do a wonderful job in uh, keeping the perspective of, of our people, not inserting or whitewashing any of our stories. Now, if you have a bit more of an academic interest in the stories, the other Beerhorst book I would recommend is, um, oh, is it stories? Oh, I have it right here. Here it is. Okay. Mythology. Mythology of the Lenape Guide and Texts. That book is, uh, it's going to be uh, too much or, or, and also not enough for people who just want to pick up a book and hear about some of our stories. There are uh, hundreds of small blurbs and references to other stories where they appear and some analysis and things like that. So if you're like me and you're a mythologist, that will be your favorite book in the world. Um, and there's also three or four full length stories in there. So those would be my first recommendation for stories. Unfortunately, it's very hard to uh, come across collections of Lenape stories. That's actually part of my dissertation. I'm working on one because very often we get, uh, if we're mentioned at all, we get lumped into Algonquin stories and you have no idea if the stories you're reading are Lenape or any of the other Algonquin tribes, things like that. Now, as far as art, um, I'm not sure I understand the qu question. Like any art performed by a Lenape person is Lenape art. So I guess my answer would just be verify the artist. Oh, that's great advice. I appreciate it. All right, folks, if you can believe it, we are almost at the end of our hour. And I know truly dozens and dozens and dozens of you have asked such great questions. So I want I know that um, Adam shared there's this contact form on their website. You know, it, it um, there, even though he's doing a lot of presentations and they're very busy this month, um, Adam was very kind enough to get back to me when I had my own my own questions and and wanted to explore more. So I encourage you, uh, the links will be in the chat, and we're definitely going to continue to use the time we have left for just a couple more questions. So Adam Teresa asks about how there's been a lot of teaching in elementary schools in PA about the Lenape. And she's wondering, and, and I'm sure many of us are, have Lenape representatives been able to view these materials and units and make an, inf an impact on how this information is taught? That's a great question. Um, I'm not aware to what extent elementary schools are teaching the Lenape. I'm happy to hear someone say that they are. Although, of course, also, um, I don't want to say skeptical, but uh, wanting to be sure that they're teaching it in a good way. Um, I work with schools on curriculum development and how to teach about the Lenape in a good way, but I work with colleges and sometimes high schools. We have a member of the nation, Blue Jay, who is amazing. Uh, at working with early childhood education. And she often goes out to schools who ask us to come present or to um, elementary schools will ask us, you know, how can we teach and what can we teach? And she'll go out and work with them. So we have that resource available and, and Blue Jay goes out a lot. Uh, that's the best I can tell you. I hope that uh, if those aren't one of the schools that Blue Jay has visited or that someone has, that they would get in touch with us just to make sure they're teaching the right thing. Great. Wonderful. Thank you, Adam. All right. Our last question for today. Um, you know, many of us are wondering how, how should we continue to learn about the Lenape? How can we continue? What's the best way to, to support the Lenape Nation of PA moving forward? The best way is to get in touch. Um, uh, I mean, as far as support, like I said, we, we are a 501c3. All of our cultural programs and things do run off donations. So there's always that option on the website, but there's uh, so many other ways to support us and definitely to learn about us. Um, get on the newsletter, 
and uh, monitor the website. We have all of our events up on the website as well. And those will let you know of all the opportunities coming along to uh, come to other presentations like this or places we'll be in person and things like that. And otherwise, um, ask us, you know, have us come give a presentation at your place, have us come work on a Lenape garden with your arboretum, you know, uh, however you can think to engage us, uh, let us know. And if we can, we will. Wonderful. Adam, I know I speak for the hundreds of, of people that are that are with us today that we are honored and humbled and grateful for you sharing your time and education with us today and all of the work that you've done to preserve the and continue the Lenape culture. I want to thank the Lenape Nation of PA for the work that y'all are doing. Like I said, their cultural center is in Easton, PA, and they have so many great resources on their website that I know my colleagues are dropping in the chat, but I know the chat's moving fast. So keep an eye on your inboxes and we will ensure that we get the links and a recording of today's presentation to you. I saw a couple folks asking if they can share this with their students and that's fantastic. And I'm sure Adam would support that wholeheartedly. <laughs> Um, I want to thank each of you guys, each of the attendees for taking time out of your Wednesday to continue to learn with us and honor Native and Indigenous People's Heritage Month. And let's keep working together to ensure we do this year round and not just this month. And I best want to wish best, wish it, best wishes, excuse me, to all of you guys on behalf of conservation voters of PA and Penn Future. Continue on with your Wednesday. Keep an eye on your inbox. And Adam, thank you so much once again for joining us. Well, thank you, voters, Penn Future, and, and everyone else. Wonderful. Thank you all. Have a fantastic afternoon, and we'll be in touch soon.